قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ما أصاب من مصيبة إلا بإذن الله ومن يؤمن بالله يهدي قلبه رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran has given us an incredible insight on how to see ourselves and how to see the world around us. And the place I want to start today is actually not the ayah from Surah Al-Taghabun that I read a small bit of, but actually from Surah Fussilat, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyan lahum annahu al-haq, awalam yakfi bi Rabbik annahu ala kulli shayin shahid." Allah says, we will show them our signs, our miracles, in the horizons and inside themselves, وفي أنفسهم, inside of themselves, until it becomes abundantly clear to them that it is the truth. Now let's think about that for a moment. Allah has given us revelation, the Qur'an, and the, one of the goals of the Qur'an for any human being who contemplates the Qur'an is they become convinced that this word is in fact the word of God. It is the truth. So part of its goals, the ayat of Allah that have been revealed, is to make it clear to a human being that this in fact is al-haq. It is the ultimate truth. Al-haq also interestingly has another meaning. Al-haq also means purpose. Like Allah says, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقْ He created the skies and the earth with truth, what also means with purpose. So not only do we get truth from the Qur'an, we get purpose from the Qur'an. Our existence is not an accident. Our life is not just chaos. It's not just a temporary experience and then it's over. It is a purposeful and meaningful existence, right? And these are the conclusions a person draws when they contemplate the word of Allah. But in this ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal now says that we will show them our signs not in the Quran, but in the horizons outside. And we will show them our signs inside of themselves, wafi anfusihim, until it becomes clear to them that it is in fact true, meaning the revelation, the message of the revelation is also encoded inside of ourselves. And the, the result, the conclusions that the revelation leads us to, that fundamental conclusion of La ilaha illallah, the fundamental conclusion that one day we will stand in front of our Rabb, the fundamental conclusion that this life is in fact temporary and leads to something much bigger, these fundamental conclusions Allah is saying Anyone who contemplates the horizons, the skies, and anyone who contemplates deep within themselves will arrive at these conclusions. They will realize that it, in fact, is the truth. So you, give, you get a very clear message from the Qur'an that at the very least, there are three kinds of ayat, at least. There are ayat of the Qur'an, the ayat of revelation. And the other categories, you can call them all ay ayat kawniya, but you can sub subdivide them also as there are the ayat of creation, the horizons that Allah calls. There's ayat nafsiya inside of ourselves. There are ayat, right? There's and and all of those ayat. The purpose of an ayat is to guide you. It's to guide me. And Allah is saying all of these are means by which we can guide it. Now this changes our view of how it is that a person reaches guidance. In fact, another place in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "In the heavens and the earth, la ayatin lil mu'minin, lil mu'minin." Allah says, "In the skies and the earth, there are miraculous signs for people who are going to believe, for believers. Just like there are ayat in Revelation for believers. Now Allah is saying, the skies, the earth, have ayat for believers. They're also a kind of book that you have to read and contemplate. What that does for the Muslim." is it changes their view of how they explore life. When we're learning our deen, we're learning our deen when we open up the book. We learn about our Prophet wasallam. We learn about Allah, we learn about the previous Prophets. This is one way of learning our deen, and it is the fundamental way of learning our deen. But actually, studying geology, studying history, studying chemistry, studying physics, studying astronomy, these sciences where we're studying the afaq, is also, in fact, something that can lead a human being back to Allah. I'm reminded of a famous case, and fortunately now his uh, interview is available on YouTube. You can search it yourselves. Professor Maurice Bukwal was a very famous uh, embryologist. 
who in his own studies when he was living in the Muslim world and he saw these people that are so devout to their religion, he was curious about them and he wondered what, the, what their book has to say about his subject, his field. And he's, he's been dealing with embryology his entire career, one of the world's leading Canadian embryologists. And he studies the Quran and he's among the Arabs, so he asked them, okay, I'm reading this in the translation about the formation of a baby, but tell me about this word and tell me about this word. And he starts exploring the meanings of the words in the Quran. And because of his knowledge of embryology, it led him to Islam. And he talks about why he became so convinced that the ayat of Allah were comment commenting on the ayat of creation. And there was no inconsistency between them, you know. Another very interesting figure who actually is in, in the UK, it might be uh, back in the US sometimes too, Professor Abdullah Rothman, who, you know, studied all kinds of psychology, studied psychology all over the world. In fact, he became interested in the question, what is the soul? Before he was Muslim, what is, what is the soul? And he wanted to know what the Hindus describe the soul as. He wanted to know what the shamans described the soul as. What are people that have these weird religions in the middle of the jungle in the Amazon? How do they describe the soul? What are their spiritual experiences? How do the Christians look at it? How, he traveled the world, sat among, he sat, in, he sat in Hindu temples for months just to get a spiritual experience the way the Hindus get it. You know, he sat among Buddhists. He, all, in all of these experiences and he did not consider Islam one of the contenders for his exploration until in the end somebody recommended why don't you look at Islam and what, the, what, he ha what it has to say about this all and this is someone who's well educated and well versed in the science of psychology in the science of self and he arrives at the conclusion he teaches Islamic psychology now what I'm trying to get at is the study of outside of our deen what you know lately we started calling it religious education secular education we separated these two right there's religious education and there's secular education this is a new definition this did not exist in our religion in fact our religion told us siru fil ard fanduru kayfa bada al khalq go travel in the world find out figure out contemplate how did creation begin how did they learn about the fossils learn about the ruins find these skeletal structures go find out how creation began fanduru kayfa bada al khalq this is Allah Azza wa telling the believer not to close their eyes and you know, keep the outside world outside because it will ruin your faith. You know, other religions, I don't have to name any of them, but other religions, they would basically tell people, don't learn anything from the outside, it will corrupt your faith. It will make you start having doubts. If you want to preserve your faith, stay within this protected circle only listen to these these people and if you listen to them you will your iman will be protected the devil will not get to you but the quran came and it acknowledged that allah gave the human being such a powerful a more powerful tool than anything else the human mind the human heart the soul and it's supposed to arrive at the truth by engaging with exploration and the more you explore not you become more doubtful, the more you explore, the more convinced you become. It's the opposite. We were supposed to be a people of exploration. That's what we were supposed to be. But there's a dark side to exploration. Science can be a spiritual experience. It can be. I've met people that have studied philosophy and history, and that became a spiritual experience that led them back to Islam. It can be. But science, let's take science for an example. Science by itself is blind. Science has no conscience. Science is not about good or evil. It's just observation. When somebody is studying chemistry, there are not salih chemicals and, you know, facid chemicals. It's just chemicals. When somebody is studying physics, it's just physical, physical formulae. It's just quantum mechanics. It's just, you know, these are just phenomena. You're observing reality. But people have a conscience. So if you, let's remove God and remove spirituality and remove guidance from the equation and just look at science for a moment. If somebody looks at science without any tadabbur, not looking at it, as an, at, as an, uh, uh, at it as an ayah that leads to something bigger, if you look at it that way, then it's very easy to say that we can use science for very evil purposes too. It's the same science that creates nuclear weapons. It's the same science that creates chemical weapons. 
It's the same science that creates addictive drugs that thousands of people are addicted to around the world, aren't, isn't it? It's also a product of science. It's the same science that creates weapons that kill people. It's the same science that creates, you know, uh, carcinogens. It's the same science that people use to produce, manufacture synthetic food that they know can cause all kinds of health issues, but it makes them a lot of money. It's scientists that are doing a lot of scientific study to produce what's being produced. And science is all around us. The Quran is simply telling us something. It's telling us that when you look at the, if you study and explore science, but you are seeking purpose, then you will find it. But if you remove purpose from the equation, then you can turn that into anything. And in fact, that's even true of the Quran. Wild enough. If somebody comes to the Quran and they are not seeking purpose, they're, not, they're just curious, but they're not seeking purpose. They can very well find misguidance from this book. Allah himself says, يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ Even the Quran, you cannot get guidance from it if you don't come with the right mindset. I know very, very well-educated professors, PhDs, in the study of the Quran that are non-Muslim. I know them. They've been studying the Quran for 25, 30 years. They know more Quran than most Muslims. They know more Arabic and more classical tafsir than, than most Muslims, but they're not Muslim. They'll go to a conference, they'll discuss a surah for five hours and discuss every ayah and discuss the mufassirun and then their lunch break, they're going to go have a champagne. That's, that's normal for them because they don't come to the Quran for guidance. The same way, you don't, you don't have to study the science or study science for purpose. The same way, that even applies to the word of Allah. But I wanted to turn this conversation briefly towards something else. I wanted to turn it towards a new science that took hold of the world in the last 100 to 150 years, and that's the science of psychology. Before psychology, when a human being experienced difficulty emotionally, they went through a tough experience, or they wanted to overcome their sadness and their grief, for example, right? They would turn towards religion before psychology, or they would turn towards philosophy because philosophy asked the question, what is pain? Why is there suffering in the world? What is this world all about? Right? Philosophers try to answer this question. So it doesn't matter what religion, people turn towards religion to answer their questions of the things that were troubling them in their heart. But then philosophy and even the spiritual study of psychology, spirituality, they basically got replaced slowly with this new thing we now call psychology. And a psychology is an attempt to understand ourselves, understand our deepest thoughts, understand our subconscious, understand our emotions, understand other people's behavior, our own behavior, right? You people go to a therapist and say, why do I get so angry all the time? Why can't I stop crying? You know, why do people treat me this way? Et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I'm a student of psychology myself, and I can tell you, it's a very elaborate science. It's an exhaustive study. There are, it's not just one subject. It's actually multiple departments, social psychology, personality psychology, abnormal psychology. These are worlds within worlds within worlds. And people have dedicated entire academic careers to exploring more and more areas of psychology. All of it, by the way, is connected to something in the Quran. Allah said, Sadurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusim. They'll We'll show them our ayat inside themselves. And what is psychology doing? It's an exploration of the self. That's what it is. But it removes, fundamentally removes God from the equation. Now the, per the you know, like I said, science without purpose can give you chemical weapons, can give you addictive drugs. Psychology with the removal of purpose, removal of Allah from the equation, what does it give you? Something has to be there that is the ultimate truth. And for what, hap what happened in the world of psychology, and what's even crazier is not just in the academic psychology, but because of social media, something else happened before I get to my observations. And that is that in any subject, let's say physics, any subject, let's say mechanics, there are people that actually know mechanics, they actually know physics, and those are professors and PhDs and researchers, but they don't have a YouTube page. But there's an 18-year-old who's read a couple of books on it, and he's got a 5 million followers on his YouTube page, and he's a much more popular co you know, content producer on physics, even though some of his physics 
is a joke. If academics actually looked at his work, they'd say, what is this? But he's got more followers because now you can present content in a more interesting way, even if it's not well-researched and it will sound convincing, right? So what happened with the world of psychology? There is PhDs and research and analysis and books. And then there are people who come up with their own content and they'll come up and say, let me tell you what a narcissist is. Let me tell you what a toxic person is. Let me tell you how to draw boundaries. Let me tell you if this, let me tell you about trauma. And you've got these people that just became self-diagnosing. And now these terms became popular among even the Muslim community. Now you have a young man saying, you know, my father is so toxic. He's always gaslighting me. I need to draw some boundaries between myself and my dad because he's really getting in my, my emotional space and I need some healing and I need to have some self-care. So what used to be arrogance can now be called self-care. What used to be bad akhlaq can now be called drawing a boundary. What used to, <laughs> you know, what used to be telling, you know, somebody's telling you a harsh truth. Meaning you're telling somebody a truth that maybe they don't want to hear, but you need, they need to hear it. You say, this is, t this is gaslighting. I'm being gaslit. So now what we do is we take psychology and we actually undermine some of the most important experiences in our lives because the biggest, the ultimate thing is I need to feel good. Anything that gets in the way of me feeling good is bad for my psychology. So the, the ultimate goal is to keep yourself happy. Anything gets in that way, it's toxic, it's narcissistic, this person is narcissistic, they're not drawing their own boundary. I'm being triggered. You're being triggered. What does the Quran say about that? What, what happens when you have an... And by the way, I'm not dismissing somebody having a traumatic experience. I don't dismiss that there's such a thing as narcissism. These things exist. What I'm saying is we have turned them into weaponized terms. We don't even understand them ourselves. And it's actually starting to impact the way we think about our own religion. Our, our, our cha we're not even contemplating how many of these concepts violate principles of the Qur'an. Direct principles of the Qur'an. I'll just give you one example. In Surah al tahab Allah Azza wa Jalla said, and this is what I recited at the beginning of this khutbah, Allah said, مَا أَصَابَ مِن مُصِيبَةٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Whatever calamity happened to you, whatever struck, any, any, any kind of calamity that struck, somebody got in a car accident. Somebody got, got diagnosed with a disease. Somebody's family member passed away. Somebody lost a job. Somebody got into a fight with their spouse and they're getting divorced. Somebody, you know, walked, ran away from home. Somebody, you know, they, they, they don't want to deal with their family anymore. So they blocked every number and now they're just gone forever. You have a brother that doesn't talk to you, doesn't, won't pick up your calls, won't respond to your text messages. You have a son who hates your guts. You have, a, you have a, a, a mother who just walked away from the family. It happens. There's, and people experience different kinds of calamities in life. The first thing Allah says, no, no, nothing struck anyone ever except that Allah allowed that to happen. Number one. But then the question is, why did Allah allow something so terrible to happen? Why would that happen? And Allah says sometimes in this ayah, there are many ayat on this, but this ayah Allah teaches us a powerful lesson. He says, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Whoever truly has faith in Allah, Allah will guide that person's heart. Allah will guide their heart. And what is Allah saying? Allah is saying, my heart feels anxiety, my heart feels anger, my heart feels sadness, my heart feels frustration, my heart feels this person got away with something, they should, they deserve justice, they got away with it. My heart feels that it's, it was unfair, my heart feels unrest, my heart feels all of these things, but if I have Iman in Allah, Allah will guide my heart through these negative emotions. Actually, some of those negative experiences are a test of my Iman, and if I do have Iman, Allah will guide my heart. In other words, I'm supposed to go through some of these difficult experiences to truly experience guidance. I have to go, and this will be the way my iman gets secured. And iman is the greatest asset a human being can have because on judgment day, the only thing that matters, illa man atallaha biqalbin salim. The only people, nothing will be of any benefit except people who come before Allah and they have a good heart. 
And the only way to have a good heart is to have Iman in that heart. And the only way to have Iman in that heart is Allah will guide that heart. And the only way that heart to be guided is to go through a tough experience and hold on to your faith anyway. And not let that be, not, that be shaken. And you stay the course. So this is, this is a remarkable thing Allah has said. In this ayah, Allah is telling us to face a traumatic experience, to face it, to deal with it, but deal with it with faith and not let it change you. And this is why the best people, the best people that ever lived, the prophets themselves, every one of them are victims of trauma. If you want to use psychological terms, every one of them were surrounded by toxic people. Every one of them had their boundaries crossed. Every one of them. Every last one of them had to experience narcissism. Isn't it? Didn't Ibrahim السلام, have a toxic father? Didn't Yusuf السلام, have narcissistic brothers? Didn't they? You know, isn't he a victim of family abuse? Wasn't he being gaslit when he was being called a thief? Isn't this what was happening to them? So they could take all of that, listen to all of that, and those experiences, and then for the rest of their life, they can say, I know all these fathers, they're toxic. I, know, I need to draw a healthy boundary between me and them. And accept. Even Ibrahim when he's being expelled from his own home, you know, he turns back to his father and he uses, Ya Abati. He turns, my, my beloved father, He turns to his father and says, Dad, I still love you. You may not be good to me, but that doesn't mean I will no longer be good to you. And I'll still pray for you to be forgiven. لا أستغفر أنك. I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you still. I, I, you know, because maybe Allah will turn your heart. I can't do anything about it. I have to leave now. That's okay. But I still care about you. He doesn't say, you know what? You are a narcissist. You are a toxic person. I'm glad now there's a distance between us. I need to keep you away from my own personal healing. This is not his attitude. This is not his approach. What we have done is we have created, and the, these judgments, these, these labels, they are against the fundamental teachings of our deen. And I'll leave you one last, one, one last, especially within our families. Okay, somebody, you, you could have an argument between husband and wife. Happens. Okay, don't raise your hand. But if you have an argument, husband and wife, and one of you says, you know, you're so, you're such an abuser. You're such a gaslighter. Instead of, what does the deen tell us to say? Allah says that, uh, uh, tell my servants, say something that is better and more beautiful. Because shaitan will try to cause friction between you, chaos between you, discord between you. There's an argument happening and you hear something painful. You could respond with something that will make things worse. You can also respond with something that can change the direction of the conversation towards something better. Allah is not telling you to walk away from the conversation. Allah is telling you to deal with the conversation. If the conversation is completely out of hand, Allah is saying, When the ignorant address them, they walk away peacefully. They say peace. They don't walk away stormed out. They walk away peacefully. But in this ayah in Surah Taghabun, I learned something I was fascinated by. Being a student of psychology, I was fascinated by it. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu inna min azwajikum wa awladikum aduwan lakum. Those of you who believe some among your children and among your spouses, there may be enemies for you. This is in Medina. The surah was revealed in Medina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was living among the Jewish and Christian tribes and he was also among many among the Muslims were actually leading towards nifaq. They were leading towards hypocrisy. And you don't know in your family who really has iman, who doesn't. There was a mix. And Allah is that. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, get ready for Badr or get ready for Uhud. And some family member is saying, why are you going to get yourself killed? Stay home. Just tell him you got sick. Just... Just, I'll just say you were sleep, you overslept. And tell him later. And they're trying to hold you back. They're trying to, you know, because they, they don't want him to go. Well, why do you have to go every morning at Fajr? Can you just stay? You know, and they're having these conversations. And Allah Azza wa Jal tells him that there may be among you so, so people that the family is so extreme that they might even be enemies for you. 
that extreme. I mean, you don't use this ayah and go home and say, now I know what you are to me. That's <laughs> not. This is an extreme case. These are extreme cases. The word adu is not used lightly in the Quran. Okay, but this is the extreme case. Fine, an extreme case can exist. An extreme case where your own spouse and your own children, according to Allah, are what? An enemy. What do you do in the extreme case? Well, what you do from the pop psychology perspective, the Instagram psychologist can tell you what you do in such extreme cases is you draw some boundaries and you walk away and you heal yourself and you, you know, declare them abusers and all, all this stuff. And what does the Quran say? Okay, and if you can forgive, if you can overlook, you can cover their mistakes. Okay, at one point they became really aggressive, but now they're really sorry about that. You know, don't bring it up again. Tasfahu. Safaha means to turn the page from Safha. Turn the page. You know what that means? I remember what you did last year. You remember? I still remember those words. Do you remember what you said? Mm, that's not Tasfahu. I'm still traumatized about that. Let me repeat it again as if it happened right. I didn't say it again. No, no, but it still hurts me though. I'm still traumatized. Therefore, I need to do dhikr of that all the time. I need to give you a khutbah about that all the time. Allah says, if you can just turn the page, then Allah is forgiving too. Maybe things will reconcile. Even in the worst case, there's room for reconciliation. There's room to make things better. But if the hearts are not, if, if you're too absorbed in yourself, you're not going to look for a solution. The only thing that you want to, to serve is your own your wishes. And so this is the, the, the last thing I will share with you. The, the direction that psychology is in, going in now, pop psychology, reminds me of the ayah of uh, Surah Al-Jathiyah. Did you see someone who takes their feeling, their empty feeling, and it turns the, it, they turn it into their God? Their God has become their feeling. And Allah allows this person to be misguided even though they have knowledge. They can know. They can be a PhD. They can be a doctor. They can be a professional. But they are being led by their emotions. And they give themselves a new diagnosis and give themselves other people a diagnosis depending on how they make them feel. Today you're a narcissist. Tomorrow you're an abuser. The next day you're a toxic person. The next day you're this. The next day you're depressed. The next day you're, you, know, uh, you have uh, attachment issues. You just throw out these diagnoses, label people. Allah, Allah, ala ilm. Wa khatama ala sam'ihi. Wa ja'ala, you know, so Allah says, and this kind of a person, Allah will put a, hear, a, a, a ceiling on their hearing. You know what that means? That means it doesn't matter if you try to reason with them, you cannot reason with people who live by emotions. Many of you have experienced this. When people are living by their emotions, if you're trying to be logical, it's like talking to a wall. But, but I feel, but I feel, but I feel. The feeling is, that's the God. You know? And Allah places a cover over their hearts. Who's going to guide them after Allah? That ayah, that last part of that ayah, who will guide them after Allah? You know what that means? They replaced Allah with their own feelings. That's why there's no more guidance for them. Because their ilah is actually Allah, but their ilah became their hawa. So Allah says, فَمَنْ يَعْدِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اللَّهِ Who's going to guide them after Allah? After they remove Allah from their hearts, what guidance can they have? On the flip side, contemplate Surah At-Tahabun. When a person experiences difficulty and trauma and actual difficulty in their life, whoever turns back to Allah in faith, يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Allah will guide that person's heart. وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah knows everything. There's nothing Allah doesn't know. May Allah Azza wa guide our hearts and not allow us to become, uh, you know, uh, uh, worshippers of our own feelings and actually remain worshippers of Allah in the depths of our hearts. And may Allah not make us of those who easily pass judgment on others unjustifiably. You know, uh, I know this, the khutbah is already over, but one last thing I will share with you, we cannot judge another person's heart in Islam. I cannot point at you and say, you're a munafiq, you have nifaq in your heart. I can't do it. But there's no way for me to know. 
even Allah did not let Musa know if Fir'aun has kufr in his heart or not. لَعَلَّهُ يَذَّكَّرْ أَوَنْ يَخْشَى Go talk to him nicely. قُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Both of you go talk to him nicely. Maybe he'll get a reminder. Maybe there's some part of his heart that can benefit from a reminder. You don't know. Ya Allah, it's Fir'aun. He kills babies. Come on, come on. The guy's heart is made of some kind of special stone that will never crack. No, no, no. You don't know. You don't get to know. This is Allah telling Musa alayhi salam about Fir'aun. So I cannot judge another person's heart but in this new psychology, I can easily judge another person's heart. The moment I call somebody a narcissist, I'm judging them for their arrogance. The moment I call somebody one of, one of these terms, I've, I'm not actually judging their actions. I'm judging the state of their hearts. Be careful. This is not something our deen allows. But we've made this a normal practice because we're enamored by these terms now. If you're going to understand these terms, if you're not a student of the subject, don't do it. Don't misdiagnose yourself and misdiagnose others. It's only creating a problem in our society and in our families. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim.